you doing, sweetie? Is the lily cam on? I like the way you've got the pleats all up. You look very, very attractive, though. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, Lily's all dressed up in pink. You know why? It is. Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we are celebrating. I don't know if you celebrate that or we're, we're, we're making everyone aware, including all dogs in Houston. Anyway, uh, remember I talked about uh, the, the chicken and the tigers last week, and contaminated chicken meat ended up giving H5N1 to all those tigers in Vietnam. And I had said the week before, don't worry about chickens. Well, now there's a giant listeria outbreak again stemming from millions of pounds of ready-to-eat chicken. Now, I don't know exactly what a ready-to-eat chicken is. I mean, you know, it comes to you and says, hi, I'm ready to eat, but I have a feeling that it's all that stuff packaged. It turns out it all goes from one particular uh, company. Uh, it's Bruce Pack Chicken of, Wood, of Woodburn, Oregon, and there's a plant in Durant, Oklahoma. Apparently, they provide all kinds of prepackaged chicken for a number of different uh, foods. So check your refrigerator because it's in everything. It's in chicken from 7-Eleven, Amazon, Fresh, H-E-B, my favorite H-E-B, Giant Eagle, Rayleigh's Wegmans, I love Wegmans, Walmart, Target, Croger, or Kroger as it's known in America, Publix, Aldi, Meyer, <laughs> Trader Joe's, they all have this stuff. So you got to go check and see. If you're wondering uh, if, if you have something that might be contaminated, Probably best just to throw it out or go to the USDA.gov listing and they have an entire listing of all of the potentially contaminated um, uh, chicken. Remember, Boar's Head Factory closed over its contaminated liverwurst. Nobody ever wanted liverwurst, but everybody wants chicken. So you're more likely to have this stuff, so please go check. Uh, it, Listeria does cause serious infections. There were nine deaths from the uh, liverwurst uh, contamination and uh, many, many hospitalized people. It can cause uh, serious uh, systemic illness, fever, uh, chills, muscle aches, convulsions. Sometimes people get neurologic disorders, uh, seizures, loss of balance. So be, be, uh, be sure to check. Um, there have been no adverse uh, reports yet of patients or people being infected with, with listeria from these, but it was discovered in, in the factory. And so about a precaution, there's been this 10 million pounds of recall. So other things in the news, the FDA just authorized the marketing of the first home flu and COVID test. This is cool because you can do a combined test. Uh, it's very similar to the rapid test we use for COVID, but this way you can detect both flu and COVID. So as the season of flu approaches, uh, you know, this is a great opportunity to do something at home. You can do a nasal swab 15 minutes and and no, as, as I said, the treatments are the same. Uh, I mean, the, not the treatments, the, the approach is the same in that if you're positive for either flu or COVID, you know, stay home, uh, remain at home until you're symptom-free or fever-free for 24 hours. If you have to go out, wear a mask and avoid crowds. So, you know, we talk a lot about uh, the TEFI, the Texas uh, Epidemic Public Health Institute, as being sort of the cutting-edge approach to how we monitor emerging pathogens or emerging viruses in particular. Eventually, we hope someday that the whole nation has this in, in place where you can kind of follow what the pathogens are that are around, what are com coming, what are going. So TEFI does this very well. And if you look, they look at many viruses and wastewater and covers 80% of, of Texans. And what, what's really interesting is you can see SARS-CoV-2 was really, really high in July and August and has come down. Enterovirus that we call summer cold, it really started peaking in June, July, and August. It's finally beginning to come down, but it's still probably most likely the cause of a, of a respiratory illness, upper respiratory, like cold-like symptoms uh, now are more likely to be enterovirus than SARS or, or COVID. Parvo-19 was a big problem in the summer, in the spring and summer, and is gone. Influenza has not started, and speaking of influenza, if you look at the national trend for wastewater, influenza A is still down. So the season hasn't started, but it's coming, so be sure to get 
your uh, influenza shot. Uh, many people have asked me, can you get both COVID and influenza? Yes, you get them both. It doesn't, they're equally efficacious together as a part. So what's the data with COVID? It's really kind of remarkable. Uh, in the July and August, we really had a big peak. I thought it would continue to rise uh, through this fall, but it hasn't. In fact, it's, it's really fallen. This is the wastewater data. That's kind of the leading indicator. If you look at the next uh, most likely indicator of what's going on, it's emergency room visits with COVID positive tests, also down. Uh, the hospitalization rates are lagging. So these people who get hospitalized have been, you know, we're often infected for six weeks ago. And you can see it's, it's still up, but it's beginning to come down as well. So I, this is a little technical, but the, it's really kind of fascinating what's going on with the evolution of this particular virus. So. Right now, uh, the dominant strain uh, is KP 3.1.1. This is the one that we, it's right here in blue. Uh, JN1, which was the dominant strain last year, is virtually gone. And I like to show these evolutionary trees just to give you some context because it's quite interesting how the virus evolves. If you recall, Omicron was the big uh, dominant strain in 2022. That one strain that was uh, that evolved in Denmark that we thought would take over the world didn't really do that until it got one more mutation and became JN1. That was the dominant strain in 2023. Interestingly enough, the Novavax target for their vaccine is JN1. Uh, last season's vaccine from Moderna and Pfizer was to this particular strain, XBB 1.5 which was close enough related so that it was effective. It wasn't perfect, but was effective. This year have been the evolution of what we call the FLIRT variants because of the phenylalanine to leucine and arginine to three any mutation in the, in the spike protein, FL, an F to an L and an R to a T, that's why they're called FLIRT. And they're all the ones that are, are these K variants. Uh, we talked about the dominant strain this year being K3.0, 1.1, I showed that. That's all this blue over here or teal colored. The target for this year's vaccine by Moderna and, and Pfizer, not to that dominant strain this year, but one closely related. So it should be very effective. And I mentioned XEC. This is the strain that is a recombinant between two closely related strains, was identified in Germany and Denmark, and we fully expected it to become a very major strain. Well, interestingly enough, now it is already up to 10% of the new viruses. So here's a great example of we had this stable situation, two viruses probably in the same person recombined and is now becoming the dominant strain. It is most likely that XEC will become the dominant strain over the next four to six months. The good news is the vaccine from Moderna and Pfizer will likely be very effective against that. There was a recent paper that even looked at the Novavax vaccine. It's effective against XEC because it's on the same evolutionary uh, tr uh, tree there. So I think the vaccine, the bottom line is the vaccines are really going to be pretty good this year. This is going to be the dominant strain. The virus continues to evolve across the world, in this case in Germany and Denmark. And until we get all the virus suppression uh, around the world, uh, until the virus is really suppressed around the world, we will continue to see evolution. And likely this will happen every year. We'll continue to have to have uh, vaccines. So what's going on with the Travelers Program? This is the program where we look at wastewater in, in airplanes and airports in eight, in eight different uh, entry points into the United States. It's not coming down as fast as is in the US. In fact, it's pr still pretty high. I have many friends who traveled to Europe this year, and many of them got COVID. If you look at who's got COVID, often they've traveled abroad. So there's still, you know, we, we're already coming down in the United States, but in Europe and elsewhere, there's still a lot of virus and COVID infections going on. When you look at what is in those, in, uh, in the wastewater from airplanes coming in, it's a little bit different. I showed you JN1 had disappeared. JN1 is still there in Europe, so that's already gone in the U.S. And this one is EG5. This is one no one expected to appear and suddenly has appeared. And it's not even all that closely related. It's down here, if you look, EG5. I have no idea where that's coming from. All we know is from airplanes from far. 
So it's interesting, but that may be another variant that is really um, uh, may emerge. Right now it looks like XEC, that recombinant from Germany, is going to be the one that sort of becomes the dominant strain as we go in towards Christmas and New Year's. Um, I already mentioned what to do if, you, if you're COVID positive. The main thing is it's like flu. Uh, stay home. It's symptomatic here. If you're over the age of 65, take Paxlovid. That's what I would strongly recommend. So what's going on with bird flu? Uh, right now, the big problem in, with bird flu is actually in California. Third human case has just been um, identified. Again, it was a person who was taking care of dairy uh, cattle. It has really gotten to be a problem in California so far. 93 California dairy herds have tested positive. Uh, when you think about there's 1,100 herds, 1 1.7 million cows in California, they provide 20% of the milk production. It's a real problem. And in California, unlike in, in Texas and some of the other states, it seems to be more severe for those, uh, those cattle. Higher percentage of symptomatic uh, cattle, larger number of dead cattle. And so, you know, this is probably going to impact milk prices. And, you know, we don't know. It still doesn't. There's no alert from the CDC that it's going to jump into people. When it gets into people, it seems to be a dead-end infection, causes a conjunctivitis. That's about it. But the mere fact that there's more and more virus in dairy cattle, it's in a mammal, it keeps getting into people, either through the uh, dairy industry or poultry industry, makes me very concerned. Uh, there are now a total of 20 cases, six in California from cattle, some in Michigan, one in, in Colorado, one in Texas from cattle, nine in Colorado from the, from the poultry industry. So total of 20 cases already. What's the U.S. doing about it? I personally feel they ought to be vaccinating the cattle. We could easily make enough vaccine to vaccinate cattle, but we're not. Uh, instead, what we're doing is stockpiling a lot of emergency bird flu vaccines. The government announced $72 million in funding for uh, several companies to uh, produce 10 million uh, vaccine doses in the first quarter of 2025. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I mean, they're preparing for an outbreak. I think that we could be doing more, at least for cattle. Can't, you can't, uh, you know, really vaccinate all the chickens in the world. <laughs> Besides, they keep coming in infected with listeria, so who the hell knows? Anyway, uh, let's, uh, I want to end today with a couple of shout-outs, but first I want to show this great image. This was produced by uh, the first place winner of our scientific image contest. It's called My Mitochondrial Mischief. Mitochondria are the little energy packages in cells, and uh, they're always misbehaving, but I really like this. So this is an image taken by Dr. Lily Bake, postdoctoral associate, associate in molecular cell biology. And this is the response of a, a triple negative uh, breast cancer cell to what happens when it's, in, it, it's exposed to chemotherapy. So that... Hopefully, it's a cell undergoing cell death, but it's fascinating. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout-outs. The first is to um, the Teen Health uh, Clinic in Bayland. This week, I was, in fact, uh, I was just there this week opening a new Teen Health Clinic at the Bayland Community uh, Center that is uh, in Harris County Commissioner Leslie Briones' precinct with her vision uh, to improve health for teens that are uh, uh, have under-resourced. She partnered with us and the community. Uh, they built a beautiful community clinic. The Baylor physicians will staff it, uh, and it really provides young adults from ages 13 to 24 with medical services, uh, social work services, um, uh, health care, and uh, 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 mental health support. So we're really proud of uh, Commissioner Briones. It's a great vision, and we love working with the, the county to try and improve the health care for those who can't afford it. Uh, in addition to that, I, spent, I got an opportunity to participate in the blue, co blue coat ceremony at Rusk Middle School. So these are when the sixth, sixth graders move to the seventh grade. They receive blue coats that represent their support in pursuing careers in health, uh, health or technology. Uh, all family members were there. Uh, it was really great to see these young students who hopefully will be leaders uh, in healthcare and technology in the future. Also, congratulations to Dr. Kara Marshall, one of our uh, great assistant professors here in neuroscience. She's a McNair Scholar. She's been named to the 2024 class of Rita Allen Foundation Scholars. She's among seven researchers nationwide who were chosen in recognition of their research to advance knowledge 
on development prevention and treatment of human diseases. She's based on the molecular mechanisms that remediate and detect mechani mechanical forces uh, within the body. Really great scientist and I'm very proud of her. And then finally, Dr. Ken Maddox, Professor of Surgery at Baylor, has been awarded the American Medical Association's Distinguished Service Award. It's given to one physician per year in recognition for a lifetime of service in teaching, research, uh, writing, and leadership. Dr. Maddox has made tremendous contributions uh, in these are areas, particularly in trauma medicine during his more than 60-year career at Baylor. And with that, I hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week.